day, my menopause students. <laughs> Class is back in session. I'm Menopause Taylor, your educator. You've joined me in tutorial number 323. It's the fourth video in our unit on endometrial uterine cancer. The specific uterine cancer of concern to us at menopause is endometrial uterine cancer, or the uterine cancer that begins with the glandular endometrial cells lining the inside of your uterus. In the last video, I presented the three risk factors for endometrial uterine cancer. You are at risk for endometrial cancer if you are old, fat, and female. The acronym for this is OFF, OFF. Well, risk factors are one thing, but a causative agent is another. So while being old, fat, and female put you at higher risk of getting endometrial uterine cancer, there is one thing that is an absolute cause of endometrial uterine cancer, estrogen. That's why the second F in OFF for female is really about excess estrogen. And today we'll be putting estrogen to the test as a definitive cause of endometrial uterine cancer. In my book, whether you have the first edition or the second edition, this material is in chapter 31 under the section entitled, Beware of Estrogen Alone. But this video gives you so much more. In the last video, I reminded you of the differences in the terms cause, risk, association, and link. And I've actually given you an entire video on just those words, and that's because it's so very critical to use them properly. But most people don't. Most people blur all the boundaries between them. And the very reason there are boundaries is because there are different qualifications for each in terms of how something contributes to a disease. The strongest word is the word cause. We use it so free freely, but that's really very careless. It takes a lot to prove that something actually causes a disease. But unfortunately, people tend to extrapolate the meanings of other words to imply that something causes a disease when it has not been proven to cause that disease. And most of the time, it's because instead of causing a disease, the agent increases your risk for the disease, but by itself does not cause it. Or the agent may be commonly associated with the disease, but by itself does not cause it. Or the agent may be one of many steps that is a part of a progression to a disease, but by itself does not cause it. In the case of endometrial uterine cancer, though, there is one thing that actually causes it, estrogen. So, to convince you that estrogen definitely causes endometrial cancer, I'm going to prove it. Remember, by saying that estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, we are saying that it alone induces that first normal cell to transform into a cancer cell. I showed you this prop way back in video 312 on common characteristics of all cancers. And I used it to explain that all cancers begin with one single cell encountering a stimulus that causes it to transform from a normal cell into a cancer cell. So by saying that estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, we are saying that estrogen alone is the very stimulus that can cause that transformation. And it can do so all by itself without anything else contributing. You know, medicine 
is a lot like law in some ways. That's why I'm dressed as both a doctor and a lawyer today. <laughs> Actually, I am both a doctor and a lawyer, so it's apropos. <laughs> in law, you have to prove that someone committed a crime. In medicine, you have to prove that an agent causes a disease. In law, there are certain rules of evidence that enable you to prove that someone committed a crime. In medicine, there are specific tests of causation that enable you to prove that something causes a disease. So I will use the tests of causation to prove to you that estrogen is indeed a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. There are actually six separate tests that estrogen has to pass in order to be the cause of endometrial uterine cancer. So first, I'll tell you what those six tests are. One is the consistency test. The second is the dose relationship test. The third is the estrogen alone versus estrogen plus progesterone test. The fourth is the persistence test. The fifth is the type of cancer test. And the sixth is the timing test. So let's put estrogen to the test for each of these to prove that it does indeed cause endometrial uterine cancer. So the first test is the consistency test. The consistency test says, if estrogen causes the cancer, then there should be consistency of the relationship between estrogen and endometrial uterine cancer from one study to the next study to the next study. If there is consistency from one study to another, then estrogen just might be the cause of endometrial uterine cancer. But if there is no consistency, then estrogen fails the consistency test, and it is doubtful that it's the cause of endometrial uterine cancer. Well, all the studies on the causative effect of estrogen on your uterus are consistent. They all agree. Estrogen thickens the lining of your uterus. Remember this? And anything that makes your inner uterine lining thick and remain thick is a potential cause of endometrial uterine cancer. So this test considers all the various studies on the topic. As you've seen in the three units on the diseases of estrogen deficiency, it's not easy to find studies that agree with one another. One of the reasons you feel so confused about so many things pertaining to menopause is because studies do not agree on much. Well, here you have an undeniable, reliable, reproducible test that rings true in study after study. So estrogen passes the consistency test as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. That's Proof. The second test is the dose relationship test. Now this test says that if estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, then there should be a dose related effect. In other words, higher dosages of estrogen should be associated with higher rates of endometrial uterine cancer. And lower dosages of estrogen should be associated with lower rates of endometrial uterine cancer. That makes sense, doesn't it? It wouldn't make sense if higher dosages were associated with lower rates of cancer. Well, once again, it turns out that there is an absolute dose-related effect between estrogen and endometrial uterine cancer. Higher dosages of estrogen do cause more endometrial uterine cancers than lower dosages, dosages of estrogen. So, 
Estrogen passes the dose relationship test as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. That's proof. The third test is the estrogen alone versus estrogen plus progesterone test. This test is necessary by virtue of the fact that your body produces both estrogen and progesterone. One of the most basic principles of the scientific method is isolation. Isolation is where you study one thing at a time. If possible, you change only one thing at a time. But with your own body producing both estrogen and progesterone, it's difficult to isolate the effect of estrogen alone. Of course, once you're postmenopausal, this is possible. But even then, you want to know the differences in the effects of estrogen and progesterone on your uterus. Since we're only addressing estrogen as the causative agent, this test serves to isolate it. This test says that if estrogen causes the cancer, then there should be a higher incidence of endometrial uterine cancer in women who take estrogen alone than in those who take both estrogen and progesterone. And since estrogen and progesterone are both present in your body, we need to know the difference in cancer rates when you take estrogen all by itself versus when you take estrogen plus progesterone. It wouldn't make sense to say that estrogen causes a cancer if women who take estrogen all by itself have lower rates of cancer than those who take estrogen plus progesterone. Well, estrogen passes this test too. Women who take estrogen alone get endometrial uterine cancer, whereas those who take both estrogen and progesterone do not. This is why you have to take progesterone as part of your HRT if you still have your uterus. So estrogen passes the estrogen alone versus estrogen plus progesterone test as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. That's proof. <laughs> the fourth test is the persistence test. You see, Cancer is all about a cell that transforms into a cancer cell and won't stop growing. Once it gets started, it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. In other words, it persists. The agent that caused that first cell to transform into a cancer cell doesn't even have to hang around for the cancer to grow and spread. All the causative agent has to do is start the process. After that, the cancer grows on its own. So the persistence test says that if estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, the increased risk should remain even after you stop taking estrogen. I mean, the estrogen would have already done the job of getting the cancer started. So if stopping the estrogen changes your risk or the incidence of endometrial uterine cancer, then it wasn't the cause. It might have helped it grow in some way, but it didn't initiate the process. And if only current users of estrogen have an increased risk, but past users of estrogen don't, you have to scratch your head and wonder how the cancer disappears if you stop taking the estrogen. Well, the increased risk for endometrial uterine cancer does persist long after discontinuing estrogen. Not only that, longer duration of estrogen use results in higher incidence of endometrial uterine cancer. Furthermore, the risk for endometrial uterine cancer lasts for at least five years after discontinuing estrogen. So there is no doubt that estrogen passes the persistence test.
It proves estrogen as a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. The fifth test is the type of cancer test. This has to do with the kind of cancer that develops when estrogen causes it versus when something else causes it. In other words, it pertains to the personality of the cancer. If estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, then the type of endometrial uterine cancer that develops in the presence of estrogen should be more advanced, more aggressive, less responsive to treatment, and more fatal. If estrogen causes the cancer, it just wouldn't be logical for the type of cancer that develops in the presence of estrogen to be less advanced, less aggressive, more responsive to treatment, or less fatal. Well, what do you know? The type of endometrial uterine cancer that develops in the presence of estrogen is more advanced, more aggressive, less responsive to treatment, and more fatal which is exactly what you'd expect if estrogen causes it in the first place. So estrogen passes the type of cancer test as a cause of endometrial uterine cancer. And this proves that estrogen is a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. <laughs> I sure am having fun banging this gavel. <laughs> and the sixth test of cause is the timing test. This says that if estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer, then the size of the cancer should correlate with the timing of estrogen therapy. If you took estrogen a long time ago and it started the cancer in the first place, the tumor size should be large. On the other hand, if you took estrogen recently and it started the cancer, the tumor size should be small. This goes back to the common characteristic of all cancers that every cancer begins as just one single cell. And it takes time for that single cell to replicate enough to grow into a tumor that you can diagnose as cancer. So this test has to do with correlating when you took estrogen and when endometrial uterine cancer began. No matter how quickly or how slowly a cancer grows, there is no such thing as a cancer that starts and becomes large enough to diagnose overnight. Every time endometrial uterine cancer is diagnosed, it has been there for a long time, years. When women say, I started taking estrogen and two months later it had already caused endometrial uterine cancer, they are greatly mistaken. Endometrial uterine cancer begins when estrogen thickens your uterine lining and it doesn't shed. That's very well established. But it takes a long time before it is diagnosable as a cancer because it takes a long time for it to transform into a cancer. Well, it turns out that there is a perfect correlation with the timing between initiating estrogen replacement and the timing of diagnosis of endometrial uterine cancer. It matches the time frame necessary for estrogen to cause the cancer. So there is no question that estrogen is the culprit in starting endometrial uterine cancer. So estrogen passes the timing test as a cause of endometrial uterine cancer. And this proves that it is a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. So if something passes all six of these tests, it is defined as a causative agent. And since estrogen passes all six with flying colors, as they say, there's no denying that it most definitely causes endometrial uterine cancer. So to recap, the six tests of cause are the consistency test, the dose relationship test, the estrogen alone versus estrogen plus progesterone test, 
the persistence test, the type of cancer test, and the timing test. And I have met my burden of proof on this matter. I have won my case. Case closed. <laughs> now, you know that estrogen definitely causes endometrial uterine cancer. So now, let me just tell you how the notion that it could possibly do so developed. Women have been getting endometrial uterine cancer as long as we've been around. But as you know, things have changed quite a bit over time in terms of how long we live and how we live our lives while alive. Endometrial uterine cancer was rare back in the day when lifespans were short and women died before the age of 45. And remember, back then, women spent most of their adult lives having multiple pregnancies, and pregnancy greatly reduces the risk of endometrial uterine cancer. But when women started living long enough to become postmenopausal, they started taking HRT. And at first, nobody knew that estrogen caused endometrial uterine cancer. So many women took estrogen all by itself at the time of postmenopause. I mean, after all, estrogen is mama bear's hormone, not progesterone. Women are mama bear. So doctors gave all women estrogen replacement at the time of menopause, just as they gave insulin for diabetes or thyroid hormone replacement for hypothyroidism. As a result, many women took unopposed estrogen replacement for many years. But then, in the 1960s, the first cases of endometrial uterine cancer related to estrogen replacement were reported. And it was determined that unopposed estrogen was the culprit. Unopposed estrogen means estrogen without progesterone. The unopposed estrogen constitutes excess estrogen. And it took years of unopposed estrogen to even increase a woman's risk of developing endometrial uterine cancer. But the risk and the rates of endometrial uterine cancer increased with dosage of estrogen. And they increased with duration of estrogen replacement. And the risk also persisted even after stopping estrogen. So you see that the way this played out is completely consistent with these tests of causation that prove that estrogen causes endometrial uterine cancer. I, I tell you this because, as always, I want everything to make sense. Everything should make sense. All the pieces should fall into place when you learn the facts and see how they play out historically and currently. In the case of estrogen as a cause of endometrial uterine cancer, you see just that. This is where a true education makes all the difference. When you learn everything in order and you connect all the dots, it makes perfect sense and you are not confused. <laughs> and it enables you to prove your case, just as I have done here today. So, case closed. So what you've learned here today is that it is an absolute, undeniable fact that estrogen is a definite cause of endometrial uterine cancer. And next week, I'll teach you about frenetic genetics as a cause of endometrial uterine cancer. Because endometrial uterine cancer due to genetics can involve a lot more than endometrial uterine cancer not due to genetics. Go to menopausetaylor.me and schedule a consultation. And I'll prove that it is the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. <laughs> Following me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, won't prove a thing. <laughs> I won't prove anything to you there. But subscribing here and to my let newsletter will prove to be greatly beneficial. <laughs> so I will see you next week. <laughs> Bye!